regulation necessary. Now a congressional panel examines the impact of energy speculation on oil prices and whether more oversight is needed of the commodity futures markets. A group of officials with the energy industry, the first among four panels to testify before members of the House Energy Subcommittee on Oversight. The hearing just getting started. Bart Stupak in the chair. Live coverage from Capitol Hill. percent to more than $4 a gallon. And diesel costs are up 188% to $4.70 per gallon. The wallets of consumers have been hit hard and industries that depend on energy are hemorrhaging and red egg. And for some companies, their very survival is in jeopardy. But what has caused this unprecedented rise? Is it too much demand chasing too little supply? Or is it excessive speculation and greed inflating prices? Here's what some of the oil experts have said. Quote, I cannot think of any reason that explains the run up in crude oil price besides excessive speculation. Fidel Gatt, Managing Director, Oppenheimer & Company, who will testify today. Another quote, there may now be upwards to $25 to $30 of speculation in the price of crude, which continues to soar despite stockpiles in the U.S. MF Global Energy Risk Management Group. Quote, the proper range of oil prices should be somewhere between $35 and $65 a barrel, John Hoffmeister, president of Shell Oil Company. The International Monetary Fund also echoes these views. Quote, it appears that speculation has played a significant role in the run-up in oil prices, as the U.S. dollar has weakened and investors have looked for a hedge in oil futures and gold. What this means is that oil has been transformed from an energy source into a financial asset like gold, where much of the buying and selling is driven by speculators instead of producers and consumers. It means that bets are placed, driven by interest rates, inflation expectations, and portfolio manager investment decisions." End of quote. The growth of commodity index investments supports the IMF conclusion that oil has become a financial asset. They have skyrocketed from $13 billion in 2003 to an estimated $260 billion in March of 2008. Just this past weekend, the Secretary of Energy and oil ministers met in Saudi Arabia to discuss oil crisis. However, the Secretary of Energy could have made a much shorter trip to New York or Chicago to find an immediate way to address high prices at the pump. We must end the excessive speculation in the energy markets. Even the Saudi oil minister has argued that high oil prices are due to excessive speculation in the markets. Bringing down oil prices will, will require a multi-pronged approach of conservation strengthening the value of the dollar, and ending excessive speculation in the energy markets. My bill, H.R. 6330, known as the Prevent Unfair Manipulation of Prices, or Pump Act of 2008, will deliver the quickest and most comprehensive reforms needed to end excessive speculation. Since the most popular commodity index, called the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, has 78 percent in energy commodities like oil and gasoline, it seems fair to ask whether a 20-fold increase in commodity index investment is contributing to a bubble in oil prices. Lehman Brothers estimates that uh, benchmark crude oil futures price goes up about 1.5 percent for every 100 million in commodity index investments. Why is this phenomenon significant to you when you fill up your gas tank? Because your pension fund manager may be using your retirement money to drive up the price of oil. What would happen if pension fund managers decided to increase the commodity investment by another 20-fold? We don't know the answer, and apparently neither does anyone in the administration, but nothing is standing in their way from increasing such investments. This is what the experts are saying. Let's look at some of the data. Chart 1. Chart 1 shows the number of futures contracts for crude oil has grown 425 percent, almost in lockstep with the oil price increases over the past five years. Chart number two shows that the speculators have increased their share of futures contracts in oil from 37 percent in 2000 to a whopping 71 percent in April 2008. Meanwhile, the producers and refiners who actually use futures market to hedge price risk have shrunk from 63 percent to 29 percent. What's going on here? Have speculators hijacked, hijacked trading on the futures exchanges? We are told we should be grateful to speculators for providing liquidity that allows the futures markets to operate. But this data suggests that oil futures market is drowning in liquidity. 
Today we hope to learn whether this wave of speculation has separated prices from the very supply and demand fundamentals that are supposed to balance the market. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission tells us the speculators are simply following the price signals set by physical consumers and producers. But given this imbalance, you have to wonder if the regulator is missing the force for the trees. Chart 3. Chart 3 shows the rapid growth in swap dealers buying oil futures. Swap dealers are investment banks who set up the commodity index deals for pension funds and sovereign wealth funds. In 2000, these swap dealers had only 10 percent of the contracts to buy futures contracts. However, the number, the number has tripled to 30 percent in 2008. In fact, New York Mercantile Exchange, NYMEC, has granted 117 hedging exemption since 2006 for Western Texas Intermediate Crude Oil contracts, many of which are for swap dealers with no physical hedging position. Is it a coincidence? The investment banks have tripled the number of futures contracts they are buying at the same time that oil prices are skyrocketing? Today we want to find out whether the CFTC understands the degree to which speculators of various stripes and motivations have seized control over a significant majority of oil futures. We want to find out whether the CFTC is going to shed light on the vast over-the-counter market where energy derivatives are traded but go unregulated. We want to find out if the CFTC and its staff are sufficiently motivated to question the activities of Wall Street and its powerful investment bankers. We want to explore the arcane loopholes which allow investment banks and commodity dealers to evade speculative position limits that are supposed to prevent price distortion. CFT CFTC claims it found no evidence that the futures markets have been subject to excessive speculation. But on May 29th, it issued a special call to swap dealers for data on their investment in commodity indexes. We note this action came nine days after one of our witness, Mike Masters, questioned the impact of an estimated 20-fold increase in commodity index investments. Today we will also assess the impacts to key sectors of our economy, such as the airlines, trucking and petroleum marketing. Airlines are eliminating service to over 100 cities, laying off, laying off thousands of workers, and projecting up to $13 billion in losses this year due to jet fuel price increases that cannot be passed on to the consumer. Last week, CFTC, Commodities Futures Trading Commission, reversed its long-held view regarding one loophole that allows foreign boards of trade to offer electronic trading screens in the United States, but it still allows these trading on these terminals to play by a less rigorous, res, less rigorous rigorous, less rigorous regulatory standards in a foreign country. When we held our last hearing on energy speculation on December 12th, CFTC opposed the idea of requiring ICE futures in London to abide by U.S. rules governing excessive speculation regarding crude oil. Six months later, I'm pleased to see the CFTC drop its opposition and will require ICE traders to be governed by certain U.S. rules. This is not the only loophole we need to examine. We also need to look at eliminating exceptions for swap dealers, providing greater transparency for trading in the $9 trillion over-the-counter market for commodities. We will look at whether it makes sense to prohibit index speculators from using commodity markets and whether increasing margins on financial speculators is a way to burst the oil price bubble. Make no mistake about it, excessive speculation in commodity markets is having a devastating effect at the gas pump and is rippling throughout our entire economy. If we do not act now with swift diligence, we risk having our economy brought to our knees. This committee has responsibility for energy policy and we, we intend to make sure that we find solutions, place them on the President's desk and deliver relief to the American people. We hope today's hearing will help illuminate this issue for the administration and the American people. Then we can work together on a bipartisan basis to solve this problem. I next go to the gentleman from uh, Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield, for his opening statement, please. Well, Chairman Stupak, thank you very much, and we certainly welcome uh, our witnesses today on this important hearing uh, relating to energy. Last week, the Energy Information Administration reported the gasoline average price was 4.13 a gallon across the country, more than one dollar a gallon over last year. Diesel prices last week averaged four dollars and seventy cents per gallon, almost two dollars per gallon more than this time last year. Heating oil and jet fuel prices are also at record highs 
as is the cost of crude oil, which has risen almost $70 per barrel, double the price a year ago. The American people and others uh, want to know, is this due to supply and demand? Is it due to excessive speculation in the futures market? Is it due to the declining value of the dollar, uh, refinery capacity, or a combination of all of these things? This morning, we are going to hear from witnesses who will describe the economic impact that these prices are having on their businesses and, that, and how that is affecting their continued opportunity to provide jobs. We will also hear from energy market economists and participants who will explain the recent run-up in prices and help us understand, hopefully, whether the growth in non-commercial speculation in the energy commodities market is inflating oil prices significantly beyond underlying market fundamentals. The energy futures market is certainly a complicated market, and it serves an important function for those who actually buy and sell oil to hedge price risk and reduce price volatility. It also appears that it has served financial markets more broadly as a hedge against the weakening dollar and inflation. The numbers here are as dramatic as those we see at the pump. Over the past five years, the number of oil futures contracts has jumped from 700,000 to more than 3 million. A large portion of this growth has involved not traditional physical oil hedgers, but institutional investors such as public and private pension funds who are now getting to this market. The value of open interest associated with these institutional investors has risen from a mere $13 billion to $260 billion over the past five years. And this rise appears to correlate to the run-up in oil futures prices. We need to understand exactly what is causing this increase in prices, especially any recent factors that have propelled those prices to current historically high levels. Is this a speculative bubble driven by the market expectations and speculative fervor that prices will continue to rise? Are these expectations realistic? Does this run-up reflect the growing role and goals of various institutional investments and commodity index funds? And what does all this mean for traditional market participants concerned about the physical supply and delivery of oil? Is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission doing enough? Does it need more information from exchanges and from over-the-counter markets? Do margin requirements need to be changed? So we'll be hearing from the Commodity Futures Trading Commission today. And I would also mention that uh, many members on this committee uh, co-sponsored legislation introduced by Ranking Member Barton a few weeks ago to have an interagency study of the effects of speculation on energy prices and to have more comparable regulation over foreign and domestic markets that trade U.S commodities. We will also discuss other rules and regulations, such as increasing margin requirements uh, that I mentioned earlier. All of these matters are going to be open for discussion this morning. I want to thank Chairman Stupak for holding this uh, hearing. It is certainly a timely issue, one that the American people is extremely focused on. And I look forward to the testimony of all of our witnesses and the opportunity to ask uh, them questions to help us better understand the situation we're in today. I yield back my 45 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Dingell, for an opening statement, please. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I commend you for your superb leadership of this subcommittee. And second of all, I commend you and thank you for this hearing today. Today, working Americans are seeing energy costs take an ever larger bite out of the family budget. Costs have soared for gasoline, electricity, and heating and increased fuel prices have driven up the price of food and everything else in our society. This hearing today is laying the preface for this committee to begin to move forward on legislation co-sponsored by virtually the entirety of this committee and our good friend Mr. Barton, the ranking minority member. It is our intention to gather the facts today to try and find out exactly what is going on so that we may respond to the concerns that the American people have on these matters. Dramatic increases in fuel costs are affecting virtually every sector of the American economy. For fuel intensive industries in particular, this is a crisis. A case in point is the airline industry. 
And I want to welcome Mr. Doug Steenland, President and CEO of Northwest Airlines, who will be testifying today on the problem faced by his company and by the airline industry as a whole. Simply put, millions of Americans are feeling the pain from extraordinary increases in the price of oil, which is carrying through to price increases in everything else in the economy, especially in the energy area. This brings us to the central issue of this hearing. What caused this dramatic rise in prices? Are record oil prices simply a function of supply and demand, or are they a result of excess speculation, or both? The International Mon Monetary Fund recently concluded that speculation has played a significant role in the run-up of oil prices. A Lehman Brothers analysis suggests that more than 50 percent of the price of a barrel of oil may be attributable to speculation. The Saudis note that oil supply and demand seem to be in balance and that there is no substantive basis for current prices. Even the Department of Energy's own Energy Information Administration says that the flow of investment money has contributed to a spike in oil prices. It is commonly held by econo economists, and I've been told by one of, the, one of the great ones in a private discussion that probably at least 25 percent of the shoot-up in oil prices comes from speculation. It is unfortunate that the Secretary of Energy dismisses speculation as a cause of spiking oil prices and that the Secretary of the Treasury agrees, shrugging it off as a rough period. Admittedly, he is right. It is a rough period. But there is a cause, and it must be ferreted out. In short, real solutions from this administration's are harder to find than $3 a gallon gasoline. The oil producers say that the answer is to drill for more oil. The environmental community says the answer is to conserve energy, to change the way we live, work, and play. Both sides have a valid point. We should search for more oil, although I note that the oil companies aren't drilling on land they already have. And the environmentalists are right. We need to conserve energy. But both are long-term solutions that will likely take at least 10 years. They will do little to solve the immediate problem we face, and such actions will not curb the current excess speculation and manipulation in the oil markets. Mr. Chairman, as our witnesses will testify today, the sharp rise in energy prices during the Bush administration has been outpaced only by the rise in speculation. Energy speculation has become a fine growth industry, and it is time for the government to intervene. We need to consider a full range of options to counter this rip rapacious speculation. For example, we should examine imposing 50 percent margin requirements on financial speculators, in setting position limits on transactions across all future exchanges, requiring full disclosure of all trading by investment banks in all markets, preventing pension funds and others from using the commodity markets as an investment vehicle, and prohibiting investment banks from owning energy assets. These and other ideas need to be debated, evaluated, and acted upon sooner rather than later. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the testimony of the witnesses and working with you and my colleagues on this committee to identify the causes of the problem and to address this problem, which is of perhaps the greatest magnitude that we have confronted in the energy area in my career in this Congress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next turn to the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Barton from Texas, for an opening statement, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to put my formal statement in the record and just kind of speak off the cuff. Um, you know it's important hearing when um, Mr. Walden flies all night to be here, and Mr. Burgess and myself got up around 4 o'clock in the morning in Texas to be here, and I'm sure Mr. Rogers and maybe you, Mr. Stupak, and even Mr. Dingell and Mr. Inslee, if Mr. Inslee flew all night from Washington State, uh, we don't normally have hearings at 11 o'clock on a Monday morning. Uh, the fact that we're having this hearing and that we're all here shows how important it is. Uh, it is very important because every week, uh, probably every family in America uh, that doesn't live in a central city and use public transportation is paying hundreds of extra dollars out of their pocket 
uh, to have the mobility that we take for granted to m go to work, go to school, and do all the things that Americans do in our great society. Let me say at the very beginning that speculators are not the cause of high energy prices. Uh, we have high energy prices because there's less than a one or two percent margin of supply over demand in world markets today. When you have that tight of a supply margin, a surplus reserve margin, uh, you create a situation where speculators can drive the price higher because of the uncertainty principle uh, concerning uh, who's going to get that next barrel of oil. Uh, I could make some news today if the uh, Secretary of Energy or the President of the United States would authorize me to announce at this hearing that the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is going to begin to sell two million barrels of oil a day beginning two weeks from tomorrow. Uh, we have the capacity to produce about six million barrels of oil a day out of the SPR. Uh, if we were to put two million barrels a day of oil in the world market, we could do that for over a year. Uh, and if the President were to announce that, uh, probably the price of oil the futures in market, um, I don't know how far it would fall, but it would, it would almost certainly go below $100 a barrel and stay there. Uh, we don't use the SPR for those purposes, uh, so the President's not going to make that announcement unless we change the law or unless by act of Congress we direct the President to do that. Uh, but the fundamental problem that we have is that the world is using 85 to 86 million barrels of oil every day and the world is producing 85 to 86 million barrels of oil every day, and we've been stuck in that rut for the last two years, maybe three years. High prices have not resulted in the supply increase that pure markets say should result. Why is that? Part of the reason is we're not drilling in the United States in areas that we know there's oil and gas. We're the only nation in the world that has reserves that we're not developing because of a conscious decision. You can argue the debates of that decision, but the fact is we are the uh, treasure house for energy resources in the world, much more so than Saudi Arabia. So as long as we keep the supply constant and the demand goes up, you create an opportunity for speculators to move in. And what Chairman Stupak said earlier is exactly right. When he put those charts up on the board, you look at the positions on the New York Mercantile Exchange, you look at the volume of trading that's increased on the ICE Exchange, and most of it is in what people call video barrels. Now, I didn't know what a video barrel was until two or three months ago, but a video barrel is a barrel of oil that is never going to be produced and is never going to be consumed but it's going to be traded by somebody who has no intention, no intention to produce that oil and no intention to, to put that oil on the market. It's people at keyboards all over the world who are just deciding there's money to be made because of the tight market in oil. And what Chairman Stupak said about the various swaps and the sovereign wealth funds and all the institutional investors they're moving into oil because they look at the supply-demand situation and they don't see a supply increase. So they figure, well, heck, who knows how high? We've broken all the psychological barriers. We've broken $100 a barrel of oil. You know, now people like Boone Pickens are talking about 200 a barrel, well, 200 barrel oil. So there's, there's no psychological barrier. Why not? Why not? And when we get to the technical part of this hearing, you're going to see that the long positions have just grown beyond expectation and that all the, all the physical regulations that we put in place on the, on the U.S. market so that we can't have a repeat of what the um, Hunt brothers tried to do in, in the silver market 10 or 15 years ago, uh, the CFTC has given exceptions. They've given conscious exceptions. And Chairman Dingell and, and Chairman Stupak have written a very thoughtful letter asking for precise data on why those exceptions were given 
and how those data are being traded. So the purpose of today's hearing, and it's a good day, it's a good thing to have it on a day where we don't vote till 630. We won't, we won't be coming in and out having to, well, once we get started, we're going to have the ability for the members of this oversight subcommittee to function in the truest sense of oversight for the Energy and Commerce Committee. We can listen to the witnesses, we can get into questions for 10 minutes at a time, and really educate both the members of Congress and the American people on this market, and then decide what to do. And the, the most important thing about this hearing, I'm very glad that we have the, uh, uh, the gentleman from Great Britain that's with the ICE exchange, because it won't do any good if we get more transparency and more, more regulation that prevents unnecessary speculation in the U.S. exchanges if all that does is take it to the international exchanges. So I'm very glad that we have our, our foreign visitors here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is an excellent hearing. You've got a great group of witnesses. We've got plenty of time. I look forward to the participation in the hearing today. With that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Inslee, for opening statement, please, sir. Thank you. I, I first want to thank Chairman Stupak. Nobody in Congress has done more than Bart Stupak to really peel away the, the layers of the onion that are really hiding this explosion of speculation in the oil's futures market. And I appreciate his work and his work on the Pump Act that was introduced last week to really bring some sunshine to this. I want to make four points. First, uh, when the Saudi oil minister tells you you have a problem with oil prices, you know, you know you've got a problem. When Jose Canseco tells you you have a problem with steroids and baseball, you know you have a problem. When the Saudis tell you you have a problem in the oil markets, you know you have a problem. So I'm happy we're here today to, d to discuss that. Second, the approach that we have taken, both with this hearing and Mr. Stupak's pump bill, is to actually do something that can have an effect on prices in the relatively short term. Some people have suggested drilling in some of the most pristine areas in the country, even if it succeeded, is 20 or 30 years away, something our grandchildren could possibly enjoy, but we would not. Ending rampant speculation in the oil's future market has the capability of doing something for us uh, who are approaching uh, ARP age and above. And that is why it is appropriate for us to get to something that can actually have an impact today, this year, rather than something several decades hence. Third, those who have argued that somehow we need to have all of this enormous liquidity in the market in order for the markets to function ignore the charts that Mr. Stupak has put up, showing that the markets are drowning in liquidity. To argue that we need more liquidity is something like arguing the Iowa farmers need more liquid, more liquidity in Iowa right now. We have a flood of liquidity in the market. We have had an explosion of speculative positions in these markets as opposed to real physical risk associated with this. And it is clear that we have a problem in part because of the Enron loophole. And this is the fourth point I want to make. We really have seen this movie before. Uh, I'm from the Seattle area. And a few years back, because Congress willfully turned a blind eye, the, more importantly, the administration turned a blind, blind eye to uh, manipulation of markets in the Enron scandal, it cost my constituents literally a billion dollars in the West Coast of the United States. And we remember very well arguing with the administration that the executive branch of the government had some obligation to rein in this speculative uh, manipulation of the market that was taking place in the dark. And the response by the administration is, no problem. There is no problem. And I was reminded of a conversation when I heard Secretary Bodman yesterday say, or day before yesterday, saying, there's just no evidence of speculation in this market. And so the little bell went off in my head, where have I heard that before? Well, I heard it when <clears throat> we went to Vice President Cheney years ago. And I pled with him to take action in the original Enron scandal because it was obvious that there was a problem in these markets. It was obvious somebody was gaming the system and that speculation found a way to, in fact, had a price result. And I showed him a piece of paper showing that actually 32 percent of all the generating capacity in the United States was turned off one morning when there were brownouts in California. And I asked him for relief. I asked the Vice President to do something to rein in this speculative manipulation that was obviously going on. 
And I'll never forget, because he looked at me and he says, you know what your problem is? You just don't understand economics. Well, I think it turned out that we did understand economics, and I think we do understand liquidity, and we do understand excessive speculation, and we now understand what happens when we remove the protection of the consumers by creating this Enron loophole. And we are experiencing the results of that today. So I am very appreciative of the chairman's peeling back and shedding a little light. We know one thing, here's one economic principle that I know, bad things happen in the dark. And that's where these markets are right now, are in the dark. And it's time to shed a little light on them, and I'm looking forward to this hearing. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh Next, Mr. Walden, for an opening statement, please, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate uh, the hearing that we're having today and the list of very distinguished witnesses that we'll hear from. And hopefully, we'll all emerge from this better educated about the markets and the problems associated with them and ways that we might address them thoughtfully and, uh, and in a way that will help our consumers um, and this country. I, as I've read through the, the testimony uh, at all, it reminded me of the uh, GAO investigation I called for uh, several years ago, which was completed and revealed um, issues involving the market uh, last fall. And, uh, and I think it, for those who haven't read it, you, uh, you may want to get a copy of it. Commodity Futures Trading Commission Trends in Energy Derivative Markets Raised Questions About CFTC's Oversight. I was not alone in requesting that. A lot of other folks uh, got involved as well, but I think it, it, it's a very good report that, that outlines uh, the, the problems that are out there. And as I've read some of the testimony, it becomes clear that uh, uh, different experts uh, have different opinions on how much speculation is involved in this market. Clearly, it's grown dramatically. Clearly, it's having an effect. And the question is, how do we get transparency? How do we get appropriate regulation so that we don't have a repeat of what we saw with Enron, as, as my colleague from Washington State, I mean from Oregon, uh, have uh, folks who suffered similarly. And, and I think transparency and proper regulation is important. But I also know in, in reading through the, the testimony that um, those who dismiss uh, supply and demand and international troubles as the reason for the run-up in price basically say those things have all been counted in the market a long time ago. And so it seems to me if you want to stick it to the, the, the speculators who are inappropriately manipulating the market, then you do market reforms, but you also add to supply. And I, for one, have supported increased mileage standards. I drive hybrid vehicles. I believe in conservation, investment, new technologies. But I also agree with the ranking member that I think it's time to develop America's resources. Now, you'll hear that that's a fool's errand because it might be seven or ten years before that oil would ever come to market. And yet I believe that markets respond to signals. And had uh, President Clinton not vetoed the bill that Congress before I got here passed to allow America to access uh, oil reserves in Alaska that President Carter had set aside up uh, on the very northern part of that state, um, that was 96. If it took ten years, we would have two years of oil. It would have been coming out of, out of Alaska now. So the decisions we make today will, fa will affect the markets. I think if we indicated a change in American policy to allow us to access our outer continental shelf and um, to allow us to uh, develop other uh, sources of oil, um, we would have an effect on the market. Unfortunately, this committee at some point in the Energy Bill of 07, which I ultimately voted for, stuffed in a little provision that even precludes the use of oil uh, fuel uh, derived from tar sands in Canada from being used for military purposes by the United States military. I'm not quite sure what the uh, scientific basis of that is, but it was a political decision that sent kind of a perverse signal to the market that we're not going to accept that kind of fuel at a time when Fertilizer prices uh, and inputs are up a couple hundred percent in my district uh, at a time when diesel is nearly double what it was a year ago, at a time when the underlying cost structure for farmers has artificially been inflated because of the run-up in the input prices. We have to assess all of these issues, our access to supply domestically, invest in the new technologies, and make sure that the markets are working appropriately, and that means more transparency and more investigation into this system. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for this hearing today, and uh, I, I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses. Thank you. Mr. Malonsong, for an opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, 
uh, holding this this hearing. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity coming from Louisiana, a producing state uh, that has been producing energy for this country for uh, decades uh, and without little reward or appreciation. Uh, unfortunately, our prices are as high as everyone else's. Uh, there's a, been a saying for years in Louisiana, uh, if we could find that valve and turn it off, people would appreciate what we do in Louisiana, uh, Texas for that matter, and uh, the other Gulf states that are producing off their shores. Um, you know, I'm here today to try and understand uh, and to hopefully help in remedying the problem of high prices to the American citizens and, best I can tell in my recent conversations, uh, to the people of this world. Uh, the cost everywhere is, is going up and we need to find what has caused it. Uh, we don't need knee-jerk reactions. Uh, we don't need to continue to try and blame the people in the past that took actions because there are some moratorias that are out there uh, from other than Democrats and there were some actions uh, by other than Democrats in the last um, uh, Congress that dealt with uh, not drilling off of Florida's coast. So there's enough blame to go around. What we need to do is we need to sit down, hunker down together as a Congress, as Americans, and try and figure out what it is that's wrong with the system uh, and produce positive legislation uh, and hope that we can get the proper executive action that may be needed uh, to stem the drastic rise of uh, the price of energy, and particularly gasoline and diesel fuel and the other energies that are costing our businesses and business people and, and uh, citizens throughout the country uh, to suffer. It, it really has come home when I do get home on weekends uh, is when I hope to see my children and when their excuse for not being able to see me is that, Daddy, uh, the price of, of gasoline is so much that we're trying to conserve and we're not making trips uh, just so. And I keep saying I would wish that this would be one of your priorities. Uh, however, I understand where they're coming from. And uh, I appreciate, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you calling this hearing and hope that it will help us to understand better what goes on out there and to remedy that situation if it can be. Now, uh, you back my time. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Bird, just for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I too appreciate you holding the hearing today. I look forward to learning a great deal about this subject. We, of course, had the hearing in December, which was very instructive. Uh, you know, just think back to my, my past life. I haven't been here that long. When I was a simple country doctor, if someone asked me about futures, I really wouldn't have known what they were. I wouldn't have known that they were important. I wouldn't have known that they were around so that they would excise some of the volatility from the market and they, in fact, performed a, a useful function in that arena. Speculation involves someone putting up capital and, and risking that capital. If the market doesn't behave as intended, then that capital can be lost. If the market goes up, obviously that, uh, that individual who's invested is going to be rewarded. But manipulation really has no place in our markets. And, you know, Mr. Chairman, back in September of 2000, I remember hearing on one of the financial programs on the radio that uh, they expected the market, the market at then was in a downturn, and they expected the stock market in general to recover after the presidential election because they always do. And then several months later, uh, listening to the same radio station and a similar radio show, uh, the question was raised, well, why didn't the market recover after the presidential election? A lot of reasons were given, perhaps the long length of time it took to decide the election. But the other thing that was, uh, that was brought up was that there was just an enormous amount of money sitting on the sidelines, that people were still somewhat skittish about the market and were holding off reinvesting. Well, we now know where that money went. It went into oil futures. Now, it is my hope that at the result of this hearing today and perhaps others that we'll do in the future, again, I don't have a quarrel with speculators, but I, I do hope that people realize when they bet against the United States of America, they may well lose. And in fact, I hope they do, because I hope we are able to bring prices down, mechanisms such as Mr. Barton suggested, mechanisms such as Mr. Walden suggested, things that will increase supply and therefore bring down some of the price pressure. But we also have to have in mind firmly about, uh, about the future. Now, one of the questions that's going to be posed in probably several different ways today is should we increase the 
the margins on these futures contracts. And currently my understanding is those margins are 5 to 7 percent, and perhaps they should be higher, much higher, in the range of 30 to 50 percent. Should we also look at the fact that uh, when you buy an oil futures contract, maybe you ought to have some place to put the oil that you're going to buy? In other words, if you have no place to put it, then clearly you are only buying the contract to resell it and, and hopefully make a, pro a, a profit in the process. We're going to hear a lot of information today about the lack of transparency, particularly over the counter uh, trading and the intercontinental exchange. I certainly cannot drive around my district back home in Texas without hearing people wonder if it's not the weakness of the dollar that's caused the price of oil to increase so dramatically. But when you dissect it out, the dollar has lost 30 percent of its value and the price of oil has increased 400 percent. So clearly there's more going on than just the weakness of the dollar. So when we know, and we've heard other people reference it this morning, when we know to some degree how manipulation of the prices perhaps occurred, why have we not repealed that ability that was passed by Congress in 2000? Um, a lot of people sitting on both sides of this dais actually voted for that bill. I have the roll call vote here in front of me if anyone is interested. Speaker Pelosi voted for that bill. This is the uh, Commodity Futures Modernization Act, 19 October 2000. Chairman Dingell voted for this bill. Chairman Stupak voted for this bill. Well, now that we know what we know, why, why, what has taken us so long to repeal it? We're, after all, 18 months into a democratically controlled Congress, and with all of the enlightenment that was supposed to follow that, why, why are we still now talking about it? Well, speculation does it create liquidity. There's a troublesome aspect here. We were warned about these oil prices. We were warned in this Congress in September of 2005 after Katrina and Rita. And Chairman Barton tried to do something about it. He introduced legislation in October that would have increased supply, would have increased refining capacity, would have increased new drilling capabilities, and he was rebuffed. So now it is incumbent upon this Congress to look ahead. And don't just look at what's going on right now. Let's look 10 years into the future. We can see a day where demand will greatly exceed supply. If this is just an oil bubble right now, then so be it. Maybe we can deflate it if we do. I hope we do so gradually because I don't know that our economic system can contain another shock like it did with the banking industry. But nevertheless, we are looking at a world where demand will greatly exceed supply. So right now, right now, in a bipartisan way, let's resolve this issue. Let's resolve this issue so we're prepared for that future energy shock. And I would ask many of those who are going to be testifying in front of us today, clean up your act. Let's all declare victory because, after all, we know that business has to go on. And the economy can scarcely afford a rapid deflation of, of the oil prices, but at the same time, we cannot sustain, our economy cannot sustain the price set at the current level that it is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. Well, that concludes the opening statements of the members of the subcommittee. I'd like to recognize my colleague, Mr. Rogers. He's a member of the full committee and he's here to participate today, but unfortunately uh, will not be able to give an opening statement. Mike, do you have an opening statement you'd like to submit for the record? I do, Mr. Chairman. Okay, without, uh, without objection, it will be submitted for the record. I also expect, in fact, Mr. Ross from uh, Arkansas has just landed. He will be here shortly. He's also a member of the full committee and he'll be participating this morning also through questions. And so we look forward to those two members participating with us here today. As uh, Mr. Barton said, there's a lot of interest in this hearing here today. So that concludes the opening statements by members of the subcommittee. I'll call our first panel of witnesses to come forward. On our first panel, we have Mr. Fidel, Fidel Gett, who is Managing Director and Senior Oil Analyst at Oppenheimer & Company. Mr. Michael Masters, who is Managing Member and Portfolio Manager at Masters Capital Management, LLC. Mr. Roger Dewan, who is Partner and Head of Financial Advisory at PFC Energy. Mr. Ed Krapels, PhD, who is Director at Energy Security Analysis, Incorporated. Gentlemen, welcome. I know some of you, as well as many of the witnesses on the other panels, have traveled great distances to be here with us today. We appreciate your willingness to be here and share your knowledge with the committee. It's the policy of the subcommittee to take all testimony under oath.
please be advised that under the rules of the House, you have the right to be uh, advised by counsel during your testimony. Do any of you wish to be advised by counsel? Everyone nodding their head no, I'll take it as a no. Therefore, then I'm going to ask you to please rise, raise your right hand to take the oath. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, a matter pending before this committee. Let the record reflect that the witnesses applied, replied in the affirmative. You are now under oath. We'll now have a five-minute opening statement from our witnesses. You may also submit a longer statement for inclusion in the record. So we'll begin opening statements. I'll start with Mr. Gett. Uh, go from my left to your right. Mr. Gett, if you would uh, begin, please, with an opening statement, sir. You're going to have to press that green button so it comes on, and you might want to pull that mic just a little closer. It's Mr. Chairman, good morning. My name is uh, Fadl Gate. I'm Can you move that forward in the mic? Just pull it forward there. Good morning. Good morning. 